you heard a lot of really good explanations about what agentic really is, and yet one of the things that persists is everywhere you go, people are talking about practically anything involving AI today as agentic. The word is thrown around somewhat indiscriminately. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the real core characteristics, the defining characteristics of agentic AI are, and what separates it from other forms of AI. And probably, you know, the, the easiest before we get into the more precise definition is to think of it really in two flavors. One is agentic is that form of AI that we were talking about in the panel discussion earlier that is the, the intern, the digital intern or the digital assistant that becomes your colleague, your coworker that can um, hopefully augment your job and not replace your job. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is it's agentic AI that is AI that does more than just generate text. It actually can impact the world around us because it can create a transaction, it can update a database, it can send a message to someone. So it's more than simply going back and forth and getting text from a chat interface. Let's talk about what that really means. Um, I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to be very quick, about sort of six key characteristics that really distinguish agentic technology from more conventional AI technology. Next one. Excellent. So first, and this is something you heard about in the, in the panel discussion, but it's really important. This is probably the most significant thing that agentic does. It is goal seeking. And what we mean by that is when you give a task to an agent, you're describing the outcome you want. You're describing the goal you want to reach, but you are not describing how you want to get there. This is exactly the opposite paradigm of traditional software engineering where you start with the algorithm, the process, and you define step by step how you achieve it. Here, you define only the end state. Now, what's really interesting and challenging about it is you have to be incredibly precise and articulate about the end state, about the constraints, about the success criteria, because you're not giving it any of those hints along the way in terms of what the steps are. So the better you describe the end state, the more predictable your outcome is going to be. Next is plan and act. So once you've described that end state, an agentic system has the ability to come up with an action plan. And if you look at a lot of agentic systems, you can actually ask them to show you their plan. And they will map out for you. I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to cross check this, and I'm going to go and perform this action, et cetera. And when you think about it, that's really one of the most powerful things that they do is they take a goal and they work backwards and they figure out how they're going to meet that goal without you telling them how to do it. Next. And the other amazing thing they do, and this is probably the most um, mind-blowing thing for people when they're first starting to play with the agents, is they use tools to do it. And not only do they use tools, they have the ability to discover tools, learn how to use those tools, and apply them to steps in that plan that they've generated for how they're going to do something. That sounds like a, a whole lot of like fancy, almost impossible stuff, but there are some things that we'll talk about in a second that make that possible. But really what you need to do about agents is they have the ability, after they've come up with a plan, to look through an inventory of tools that you expose to them to effectively study what each tool does and how it works and to make a game time decision on which tools they're going to use for which parts of that task. And what's really bizarre about it is those can be tools they've never used before. And if I turn on some different tools and rerun the same task, my agent may choose this time to use different tools to accomplish that task, which as some of you are probably already thinking, could be both an incredible strength and a real liability depending on um, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, the primary thing to know, I think someone actually mentioned MCP in the conversation today. Has anyone heard of Model Context Protocol, MCP? Right. So this is, a, this is just one of the protocols out there, but this has become very quickly one of the dominant protocols for how you tell agents that you've made tools available to it. And without going into too much detail, what it really is is a format by which you can identify for an agent, here's a list of tools, and these, these tool entries, it's like a catalog of tools, and they're self-documenting. So for each tool, you're, the tool is saying, 
this is what I do, this is what information you have to give me to invoke me, and this is what I return to you, and this is, these are the types of error codes I might give you, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes they even say things like, here's my average user rating, here's the cost it takes to invoke me, here's how long I take to perform a typical task. And so an agent is actually to, able to scan that catalog of tools dynamically, real time, see what they do, see how they work, and decide which ones are gonna help it meet its goal. So MCP is really just the way that we describe all of these tools that agents get to pick and work from. The other thing, again, we heard about this in the uh, panel discussion is many, but not all agents. So everything we talked about before, goal seeking, plan and act, and the use of tools, these are common to almost all agents. In fact, I sometimes argue that if they don't do at least those three things, they're not truly agents. These are some things that are maybe a little bit more up for grabs depending on the type of agent. One of them is the level of autonomy. So they all have some degree of autonomy, which means that they're going to go through that multi-step process without having a human intervene at every step. Depending on the agent, depending on how it's designed, depending on what type of task it's doing, it will have some degree of human intervention. It may ask you to approve a plan that it came up with for reaching its goal, or it may ask you to enter your credit card information or some other credentials that it needs, um, or it may ask you to validate something. But there are large chunks of processing that these agents do that really are semi-autonomous without having constant human supervision. The other part, point about semi-autonomous is they don't necessarily need to be invoked or kicked off by a human being. They can be running on a schedule, or more, maybe more frequently or more commonly is they will be triggered by events, so they'll be sort of running in the background with a listener waiting for some event to happen. The event could be a message from my boss arrives, for example, and it has a series of steps it's gonna do when that message arrives. So they can be responsive to events that are happening. And if you really want to start thinking about where these go, imagine that some of those events could actually be the results of other agents having taken some action. And so pretty quickly you start to see how these agents really do become a little bit synonymous with the idea of employees and company, where we react to what our coworkers do. And in, case, in this case, some agents may react to outputs that are created by other agents. Um, so it gets pretty interesting pretty quickly. The, the next category of things, that, again, I would say are sort of optional for agents is that they tend to be, many of them are multi-agent capable. And um, I agree with what Anthony said, the, the multi-agent systems are not really ready for prime time today, but there are examples of agents you build that can, that can invoke other specialized agents. And so when you have these multi-agent systems, the work breakdown is that you have one agent that sort of becomes the, I'll call it the planning and control agent. This agent is responsible for developing developing the plan of action, for assigning tasks to other agents that can run in parallel, and for monitoring how they're doing, resolving any conflicts, um, and most critically, deciding when they're done. Because if each agent only knows, each sub-agent only knows about a piece of the task, none of them is able on their own to decide that the task is done. So that planning and control agent is sort of like the supervisor that sits there and says, okay, I think we're done now. Um, Really, really interesting stuff. And here's the one that is maybe less easy to observe, but is really, really important for a lot of agents is there has to be some form of memory. So if you start thinking about these multiple agents working together, or you think about multiple steps, especially when, let's pretend we're planning a trip somewhere, right? I may have a sub-agent that's a specialist agent that knows how to deal with airline reservation systems and can optimize my fare, my class of carriage, my timing, and other things. But once I've done that, once that sub-agent has booked me a flight, maybe the other agent that meanwhile is out booking hotel rooms comes back and says, well, I couldn't get hotels on the dates of those flights. So now we've got to go back and we've got to like rework pieces of that plan. Memory is what allows those agents to sort of post their results and communicate with each other. And memory is what allows that supervisory agent to observe all of the outputs and the actions of those subsidiary agents and sort of evaluate, do I have a problem? Do I have to rework a piece of this problem? Do I have to solve a conflict or have I actually reached a completion state? 
So that memory becomes very, very important for these agents. And the other thing where memory gets exposed is in these agents can store credentials. They can store your preferences. They can store instructions. They can store knowledge about you and past things you've asked it to do. So memory, while it's a little bit harder to see, becomes really important for a lot of the more, say, advanced uses of these agents. Last but not least, everyone wants to know, like, what's happening with uh, agents? How can I go play with these? There are literally more agentic frameworks out there today than I could ever name. Um, I, these are literally a, a somewhat random set of them. Um, I included some frameworks and toolkits here that range from designed to create sort of personal agents that are easy to create that don't do sophisticated tasks, but you can spin them up without any coding through to real frameworks like LangChain and LangSmith, for example, that are coding intensive but give the ability to do more powerful things. So these are just a few of the, the things you might research if you want to go out and learn a little bit more about agents. And finally, with not, without much more ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Peter, who has come up with a simple demo. He's sort of put together a quick agent uh, that does some interesting work. And, I, and hopefully, if this agent runs it correctly tonight, we will uh, be able to explain how the steps you're going to see this agent do sort of reinforce these behaviors that we said are critical to what agents do. So Peter, good luck, Godspeed, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. I decided to use Claude. Claude is a great platform for interfacing with remote agents and local agents on your computer. It makes it very simple. So the first thing I did after I identified several agents to get financial information, so part of it was economic data about companies. The other part was pulling uh, what we call SEC Edgar data. Now all public companies have to file these reports on a quarterly and yearly basis deal detailing all the internal financial information, any threats to their business, tons of information. Now most Anybody who trades in a portfolio, equity portfolio, they look at these reports in detail. They try to tear them apart. They look at all the addendums at the bottom. It's a very painful process. So one of the MCP servers I actually use allows me to interface and pull up all this information very easily. Mind you, I never looked at the API. I had no idea what calls were available. I didn't know what it can really do. The other one, the other uh, agent I actually used, um, got all the financial information ticker information for the past year or so for a specific company. So with that, I wrote a, actually I didn't even write the prompt, and I'm sorry, it's a little bit messy over here. Uh, I went to a language model and I said, I am an equity portfolio analyst. I am the best in the world. I work for you know, a premier investment bank. I said, with that, I want you to generate a prompt that will allow me to create equity research. It spit out a beautiful prompt that I was then able to put here. Prior to that, I actually had configured Claude to interface with these two um, agents that I had found. What you can see here is the thought process it goes through. Wrote this, and mind you, that prompt can be modified any way possible. This was a very simple one. It only goes to a couple of different agents. I could further augment it with a hundred different agents or all these other, and there are literally hundreds of different financial agents out there that you can use or you can purchase or you can interface with or whatever. But I kept it simple for the purposes of the demo. It shows you initially its thought process with the prompt. This is what I'm going to do first. I'm going to get NVIDIA's identification number. I'm going to pull all the last four quarters of the 10Q filings. Now, normally, you would have to go to the API or an API for these companies, for Edgar or whatever, and pull back this individual information. I know nothing about these agents. The language model, and when it interfaces with the agents, knows that it can interrogate the agent, understand what it does, then generate the code to call the agent all on the fly behind the scenes. I did none of this. So it gathers all the data, and you can see one of the things that it does. So now it'll conduct a comprehensive analysis. I used NVIDIA because you know, everybody knows NVIDIA. Uh, it gathers all the data. It makes the calls. It creates the Python script, and it makes the call to one of the agents. In this case, this particular agent, known by this particular icon, is getting all the financial information for that company. So it pulls back a bunch of information, and it'll call and make a number of different calls depending on what it's trying to get back. So the first thing it got was NVIDIA's identification information. And it's getting the date time. So you can see as it goes through step by step by step. Then it'll get all the latest filings by NVIDIA. And then it'll go on and on and on. Once it has some of this information, it'll then go through and get the income statement 
And mind you, I didn't say go get the income statement. I didn't say do any of this. It knew because it was creating equity research, it had to go out and grab all this information. In my mind, these, both these agents are on totally separate companies, totally separate platforms, know nothing about each other. But you didn't tell it how to use these no, tools. not at all. It just was able to discover those tools and figure it, out how exactly. to use them on its own. Part of what MCP does, you can interrogate it, the language model can interrogate it, it knows what to do, it knows how to make the calls, it knows how to generate the code. So, so as it's going through this, and you can see, now it's got all the data, it pulled it all together, um, and then it created this equity analysis, which is over here. Now, I will take you to ultimately to create it. And what I said also is I want it to be published in an HTML file so I can actually click through it if I wanted to, which is this. Now this whole process to generate a nice, very comprehensive, and I can tell you based on all the equity research reports I've looked at over the years, this is actually really good. And this would have taken somebody getting paid an awful lot of money a very long time to create. And instead, 45 minutes at 5 o'clock in the morning, this is what got created. And that's the power of the agents. Now there are so many companies out there creating these agents, doing separate functions. All I have to do is plug it in, make it available, add it to my prompt, and it will use it.